Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Tim just said it a few moments ago. Moses, Moses. Well, God just repeated himself here because he wanted us to sink in. Amen. He's trying to get our attention that we have overcome because he is the overcomer. Amen. And we are more than overcomers because of the blood of the Lamb. Praise the Lord and the word of our testimony. Give him a big hand this morning. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you, as always, Tim. Great job. In fact, I'm just going to end up preaching some more of your message. But I'm serious. It's, he couldn't have been any closer to myself if he'd read my notes. Praise God. So, of course, God did. But, and uh, we appreciate you, Tim, so much. And uh, thank you, Suzanne and Peter, for leading us in worship. And Suzanne and Mike for all that you're doing all the time. Praise the Lord. God is good. Amen. We want to say hello to all the people that are joining us on Facebook and uh, via the Internet. So we appreciate you all uh, taking part in the service this morning and being with us and worshiping the Lord with us and connecting with us by the Spirit and uh, thereby connecting with God at the same time. So praise the Lord. Great to have all of you with us. Looking forward to uh, next week's get together with everybody that's able to stay and be a part of it. If they're not, well, you'll enjoy some good food somewhere else, I guess. Praise the Lord. But uh, it'll be great to have a little bit of time to spend together without actually being in the church service itself. And so anybody that's comfortable, we want you to be here. And if you're not, we understand. And you'll take some good turkey home with you, I guess. Praise the Lord. So I uh, remember in an English class I took one time there. It was I don't think it was a creative writing class, although I did, took one uh, as a freshman in college, but I didn't do that great in it. But I was told to use uh, conscious stricken in a sentence. And so I said, uh, don't conscious stricken before they've hatched. I told you I didn't really do real good in that class, praise the Lord. I did know a guy one time, though. He had the Midas touch. I mean, seriously, everything he touched turned into a muffler. <laughs> These are probably going to be some of the worst I've ever done. That's in my opinion, but so. Are you saying we need to be praying more? Yes, please, please. <laughs> Confess over me. You know the difference between an angry circus owner and a Roman barber? Well, one is a raving showman and the other is a shaving Roman. <laughs> <laughs> it's just going downhill from here, please. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But I've always tried to be, you know, uh, open to things. And so I've, my, my sense is that indecision is the key to flexibility. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Well, thank you all for your patience and uh, <clears throat> sheer embarrassment for me. Praise the Lord. I was just, uh, Sally was listening to somebody yesterday. I didn't actually watch it. She was watching it on the Internet. But I did hear him say something about Reformation, and I do think that uh, that's where we're at. You have Reformation, then comes Restoration, and then comes Revelation. And so, and in the process of that, Revelation is coming, but it's just uh, developing. And I think that's so, in terms of what the individual was saying, I agree. This is a time of Reformation because God is restoring his authority and his power, not only in the church, but I believe in the land, in the earth. Amen. And so that's where we're really at. And Tim was talking about this a little earlier, about in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and that Word became flesh. It manifested. And I believe we're going to see the same thing. We have seen it periodically and uh, kind of in a broken way, but I believe we're moving into the time where God is going to be manifest multiple places at multiple times in powerful ways that this world has never seen before. And that will bring many... To, to Jesus. Those people that are on the fence right now that are questioning, that are wondering, where do I go? Who do I turn to? What do I do? And God's dealing with them right now the way he has dealt with all of us at some point in our lives. And so uh, I believe we're, we're going to uh, witness a great, great restoration and revival that comes out of the revelation of Jesus Christ and what he has done for us and what he wants to do for us in the future. So praise the Lord. Let's begin with Acts chapter 3 and verses 1 through 11. And I want to talk about the identity of Jesus and therefore our identity. Because without knowing him, 
in the, in the fullness of who he is, it's difficult for us to understand who we really are in Christ, if you understand what I'm saying. So uh, just bear with me, if you will. I've taught on the names of God before, uh, and that's kind of what I'm doing this morning. I'll be talking about some of those things, but only to, only to bring our attention to Jesus, only to get us focused on who this Jesus really is and what he has done for us and what he wants to do for us as we put our faith in him. So Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour, and a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. Who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. And Peter, fastening up his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed to, unto them, expecting to receive something of them. And then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered, in, entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. And as the lame man which was healed held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's, greatly wondering. Verse 16. And his name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Chapter 4 and verse 17. But that it spread no further among the people, let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. Praise the Lord. So included in the Bible are four books, everybody's familiar with this, that give us the, the life stories of Jesus, the Gospels. And following those are the epistles or the letters to the churches that are people already saved by the grace of God. And in between that is the book of Acts. And that's where and how the New Testament church started and how it's supposed to be how it's supposed to exist today amen so uh, it, it's established it's built on the power of the name of jesus that's how we got into this thing and that's how we operate in it by the name of jesus amen and the book of acts is an extensive documentation of that name it's all about the name of jesus that's what the whole book of acts is about trying to declare this reality to this new church, to this new people coming into this real revelation of, of Jesus Christ. And so it's through the power of Jesus that this lame guy gets healed. Amen? Acts chapter 3, again, if you will, Suzanne, uh, verses 6 and 8, or 6 through 8. Acts, Acts 3. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. The lame man had laid there at the temple for years. Every day they'd bring him there, sit, lay him outside the door, and he would beg, basically, to try to get money to, to survive on. He had... Heard of the beauty of the temple because people are coming and going all the time and telling him how beautiful it is isn't there and talking about the architecture and the so forth and so on. And uh, they were coming and going. But the law forbid him from entering in because of his disability, because he was lame, because he was not perfect physically. He was not allowed to go into the temple. But the name of Jesus opened the doors that the, laws had, that the law had barred for him. The same as it has done for us. The name of Jesus makes us acceptable to God, makes it possible for us to enter into His presence, make it possible for us to enter into the temple of God and be the temple of God for that matter. Amen? And so the law, the thing that was stopping this man, Jesus came and His name, by the power of His name, made it possible for this man to enter into, to see the beauty of it and to have access to the presence of God. Then in Acts chapter 3 and verse 16... 
in his name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And then in Acts chapter 4, Peter was brought before the rulers and the elders and the scribes. And it says, and all the kindred of the high priest, or all those that were buddies with the high priest and family and so forth. And they ask, by what power or by what name have you done this? The name was such an issue that they immediately commanded him to stop speaking this name to anybody. Don't say that name to anybody. Don't use that name in any way. We don't want to hear it. And it's no different than it is today. Don Wyckoff said last week, uh, an issue in, I think it was a Georgia or wherever it was, a little girl, her mom, they got to wear a mask. Her mom gets her a little mask and says, Jesus loves me, and they wouldn't let her wear it. Now, they want everybody to wear a mask unless it says Jesus, right? That's the world we live in. Amen. They, there wasn't a problem with preaching. They didn't care if, how much they preach. They didn't care how much they teach. They don't care how much they do any of those things. They only don't want the, the, the thing that upset the equation is the name. We don't want you preaching in that name. We don't want you teaching in that name. We don't want you using that name for anything. That's antichrist. That's a spirit. Paul said it's already in the world. He was talking about it then. Well, it hasn't gone away. It's only gotten worse and more intense, even in this country that was established on the Word of God, that was established by the Word of God, and now you can't use God's name in this country. Well, I'll be damned if I won't use it. I'd be damned if I didn't use it. Amen. I'm using that name and I'm going to continue to use it. I won't stop using it. I don't care what the government thinks. I don't care what uh, individual groups or things. Hey, if I was Muslim, I could walk in and I hold a whole classroom at, at bay. I could walk into the, the schoolhouse and talk about Muhammad. I could do any of those things. I'm not putting people down that believe that. I'm just saying that's a right we have. We had it before they ever got here. We made it possible for them to come here by the words of God that we believe in, that he is, wants to be equal to all men. He wants to be fair to everybody. He wants to love us all. But we don't have to bow our knee to the enemy. We don't have to take a back seat to something that is not what this nation was based on and what it was built on. This nation wouldn't exist today if it hadn't been for the Word of God. If it hadn't been for men and women who may not have had perfect theology, but they knew that God was on the throne and He was the one that was going to rule this nation, or it would not be ruled. It would be chaos like it is in so many other countries. Praise the Lord. The name of Jesus. That's what they want left out of the equation. There's power in the name of Jesus, and that's why they don't want that name used. I'm not saying they're all demons. I'm saying there's two spirits in this world, the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Antichrist. They are the dominant spirits. And you've got to believe, if it ain't Jesus, it's the other one that's controlling, that's manipulating, and that's using people. Amen? We have to bring experience and relationship into Revelation. In other words, it's not enough to just say, I believe in Jesus. We're in a time now where there has to be manifestation. Yes. And so we have to take what we know, what we have in our brain, and bring experience into that relationship and into revelation. In other words, we need to see the things that Jesus said we're supposed to be seeing. We need to do the things that we're supposed to be doing. It needs to be more than just abstract thought or thinking about it or wishing for it or wanting for it. We need to be doing it. That's what... Is going to, that's not only is it our responsibility as Christians, but it's what ushers in the return of the Lord. Not this crap. I mean, we've got all kinds of stuff going on. Jesus said, in this world, you're going to have tribulation. That shouldn't be the focus. The focus is Jesus is coming back at some point. And this isn't, the, this isn't what makes him come back. What makes him come back is our looking for him, our expecting, our expecting him to manifest himself in us first before he returns. Praise the Lord. In our world today, a person's name represents something. It calls to mind who we are. Something about us. Whether you can trust that person. You know, you know you, we all know people that, that they say one thing, do something else. Or they, they are just backstabbers or they're just no good. Or they're no, their name, that's what you think of when you hear that name, right? Or they can be really good, decent people that, are, that you can know you can depend on them. And what they say, they'll do, you know. And that's what comes to your mind when you hear their name, right? In ancient Hebrew thought, a person's name was an expression of the kind of person he or she was or would become. So they named their children what they wanted them to be or what they expected that they would become. Amen? And so, for example, Joseph, the son of uh, Jacob, he chose names for his children that were significant to his life story. 
So he named them so they would have that positive to go forth with. Amen? And so for his first son, he named him Manasseh, which meant causing to forget. Now we think of Joseph as being on, on the, the second to the throne in, in Egypt. But like Tim said, think of all the lonely days and nights, years that he went through without knowing what was coming. Just that he was in prison, that he was being abused, that he was being rejected, that he was being uh, taken advantage of. But he, he names his first son Manasseh, which meant causing me to forget the pain. For God hath made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. What greater rejection could there be than your own brothers trying to kill you and, and turn you into a slave? And then he named his second son Ephraim. And that meant double fruit. God hath caused me, he said, to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. I mean, we can expect God to bless us wherever we are and in whatever situation we find ourselves in. We just have to keep the faith. We just have to believe that there is a positive outcome for every situation if God is kept as the source. Amen? And in the Old Testament, the compound names of God, each one of them represent a specific characteristic of God's nature. And so, and we, we used to have a, a poster like that over here, but the frame fell apart and it's back in my office now. But nevertheless, it had all the names of, of God on it. And it's fascinating to do a study of this, but they, every name is an extension of God, and they are a self-revelation of God. God chose the names. Whenever a person was in a bind, he told them, here's my name, this is the name. And the name related directly to the position or the situation or the circumstance that that person was in at the time. He's giving them information about what you can depend on here. And so look in Philippians chapter 2, uh, verses 9 through 11, Suzanne. Philippians 2, 9 through 11. His names, they're, they're this revelation. And when you speak somebody's name, uh, before I go to this next scripture, it doesn't bring that person physically before you. But it may bring a mental image of that person to mind. As I was saying before, you can see the, you can kind of see their face. You know, you can kind of see, you know what I'm saying? It's not, it's not a vision. It's just, you know them so well that whenever you speak that name, it kind of pulls them up before you, you know? And so the literal name of Jesus can be a point of contact and it can be a point of power with God Almighty. Brings him alive, makes it real to you, you know? Not, I'm not talking about a, a, a physical image of him personally, but the knowledge of that person makes him come alive to you, even though it's in a thought, even though it's in a moment, right, while you're thinking of that name or calling on that name. So he says, wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. Now we know this is about every name, any name and every name, right? And he's trying to tell us something that this name has power. This name is above not only the, the names of diseases and, and, and pain and suffering and hurt and sin and all that, but it's above every name of God. Yes. Yeah. Amen. Because it is every name of God, ultimately. Yeah. So he says that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That, that word Lord is Jehovah. That Jesus Christ is Jehovah. Every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is God. It's just what Tim was talking about up here. Once we understand, once we kind of get the idea of what's going on here, we find out there is such power in that name. And that name has been given to us. Amen. It's, it's, it's powerful. He, there, there's, there's safety in His name. There's healing in His name. There's hope in His name. Salvation in His name. Revelation in His name. His name is everything. It's above everything. It is. It encompasses and, and com, uh, compacts everything into that name. Amen? There is the ability to know God and all of His dimensions through His multiple names. And understanding them when the meaning of those names are revealed to us. When the meaning of those names are revealed to us, we understand who God is. 
Give me a revelation of this God, this invisible God that no man has seen. Every revelation of the names of Jehovah in the Old Testament is redemptive. Every one of them. So we learn more about him because of his names. And it's interesting, Tim mentioned this too, he does not have one judgmental name at all. He never gave a name for himself that spoke of judgment, that spoke of a punishment or criticism. It was always about pull it, drawing people to him, not chasing them away, not trying to frighten them. That comes from our own uh, kind of lack of understanding and poor theology for that matter. Amen? That name is not a debate. It's a source of power. Praise the Lord. That name is power. Yes. Glory to God. Through faith in that name is the trigger. When we put our faith in that name, we pull the trigger and send the enemy to flight. Yes. Or drop him right on the spot. Amen. Yes. Through faith in that name is the trigger. We have yet to release the full power of that name. Yes. Amen. But I'm telling you, some good news is we will. Praise the Lord. The moment we begin to believe and walk in this, we begin to see the manifestation. We begin to experience revelation instead of just having head knowledge of it or uh, uh, an awareness of it. We begin to experience it. And that's what God wants. He wants us to experience Him. Not just to know Him, as Tim said. Not just to know about Him, but to experience Him. And the only way to do that is through the power of the name of Jesus. Because that's what God has given us. Amen? His name is above every name. Look at Zechariah 14 and 9. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day shall there be one Lord and his name one. He's speaking prophetically about our day. The day that we live in. Amen. Philippians chapter 2 verses 10 and 11. And at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth. That's everything. Yeah. Yeah. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Praise the Lord. His name is above the name of every sin. His name is above the name of every sickness or anything that comes against us. His name is above every name. Yeah. Period. First Kings. Chapter 18, verses 31 through 39, Suzanne. 1 Kings, chapter 18, verses 31 through 39. I'll, sh I'll show you something that Eric and I were talking about this the other day, but this, this, I hadn't really looked at this in the same way that I'm talking about it today until just the past week or so when I've been kind of studying this. Elijah took twelve stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two measures of seed. And he put the wood in order, and cut the bullock in pieces, and laid him on the wood, and said, Fill four barrels with water, and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. And he said, Do it the second time. And they did it the second time. And he said, Do it the third time. And they did it the third time. And the water ran around about the altar, and he filled the trench also with the water. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is the God. The Lord, He is the God. The word Lord again is Jehovah. They're not talking about some random God. These are, these are people that have, have, have been drawn back into paganism and some of the idolatry and so forth. But they're saying, Jehovah is the Lord. The Jehovah that we knew from the beginning, that's who God is. That's the God that, that, that Elijah was calling on, and that's the God who performed the miraculous before their very eyes. Amen? The Lord, Jehovah. The Lord, He is God. 
And that one message makes the devil tremble. The Bible says the devil believes in one God and trembles. Because he knows the power that is in that name. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now, look at, uh, let's look at Exodus. Here's, a, here's another example that has always kind of baffled me. But Exodus chapter 32, verses 3 through 5. Now, we know that the children of Israel had been held in captivity for 400 years or so, and that they had begun to kind of gravitate towards some of the idolatry that Egypt was involved in. That they had seen the multiple gods, the way they were worshipped, and how they trusted them for their rainfall and for the crops and for all the other things. And they kind of got caught up in some of that stuff. So all, all the people break off their golden earrings, which were in their ears, and brought them unto Aaron. These are them right after they got out of the wilderness, right after, or right, I should say, right after they got out of Egypt. And they, Moses is up on Mount Sinai, and he's getting the law from God. And the people down there with Aaron, the high priest, and he received their golden jewelry uh, at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. Now they, they're saying, okay, he's making us an, uh, an idol, this golden calf, and it's for the idolatry, the, for the multiple gods of Egypt. But that isn't what Aaron said. Aaron said, this, Aaron said he will have a feast to Jehovah. That's the word that he used. He said, I'm, we're going to have a feast, all right, but it's going to be a feast to the Lord. And uh, they all identified, apparently, the Lord uh, the proper name of God with the molten calf. And so the reason the Lord was so angry about that was the Lord didn't want his name attached to any other image because in God's revelatory plan through the word of God and the name, those were going to come into being as human being, as a human being, as flesh. That's the only image he wanted of himself. He didn't want any, there to be any conflict about who God was. So when God comes in the flesh, I want you to know that's Jehovah. It wasn't the molten calf. It wasn't some other religious article that you came up with. There's one God, and he's coming. And when he comes, he's going to come in the one name. Praise the Lord. He's going to come as Jehovah in the flesh. Praise God. And so here we have it, the PowerPoint of release in this, all of this. The Lord didn't want his name attached to anything other than a human being. Now, that's pretty awesome in itself that he wanted to be identified with us as much as we want to be identified with him. Yes. Praise God. So he, 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 the power point of release, he comes in human flesh, not an idol. And the, the, the way of releasing that in the Old Testament was at the invocation or at the speaking of the revealed name. That's how they did it. When they wanted manifestation, that's what they did. They called on the name of the Lord or the using of the name of Jehovah. Praise the Lord. It's, it's not a lot different than what we're doing in Jesus' name. I mean, that's what they were doing. They were invoking God or calling on God by the name that they understood him to be, the one God, Jehovah. Praise the Lord. So that embodied the character of God. Jehovah represented the character and the nature of God to these people. That's the only name they've been given. Amen. So the name. So if you go through the Old Testament, we'll, go, we'll jump up on these quickly, but Name by name in the Old Testament, Jehovah, to the New Testament demonstration and fulfillment is in Jesus. Every name of God is pointing us to Jesus. It wasn't really pointing us to an invisible. It was pointing us to something that would be physical and tangible. Amen. And so the, the name was supposed to bring us, the Old Testament Jehovah was supposed to bring us to a New Testament demonstration or experience in that name of Jesus. Hallelujah. And, and, and Elohim, for example, here's, here's the first name. Elohim, it, it comes from the word El, which means God. You know, Samuel means God hears. El is at the end of Samuel. Is, it means to hear or to have hearing. And then El, Sam, what, what was Samuel's thing? He heard God. Right? Eli couldn't hear God. He was, you know, blind and half drunk and who knows what else. But Samuel's laying in bed and he's hearing God talking to him. Well, his mother gave him that name before he was born. She chose that name before he was ever born. She didn't know where he was going to be or what his situation would be 20 years later or however many years it was after that. But she gave him the name that identified him as one who hears God. Praise the Lord. And so Elohim comes from that word El, 
And that means one who is great and mighty. And it was Elohim who was in the beginning. That's the name used in the beginning was Elohim. Amen. And it's Elohim who creates or does all the creative acts because they come from a creative name. That name means to be almighty or to be uh, creative. Hallelujah. Let there be light. Right? Elohim said that. Let there be light. And that was spoken before the creation of the sun, which didn't come for four more days. Right? The sun was, didn't exist. God just said, let there be light. And that scripture actually means, let me be seen. Doesn't mean just let there be brightness in the sky. It means, let there be light. Let there be a revelation of me. Let them see me. Right? God, <laughs> in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with Elohim. And the Word became Elohim. Flesh. It, it came flesh, right? So, uh, that word Elohim, it means, let me be seen. And it comes from a Hebrew word, Allah. A-L-A-H. Allah. Which means to declare or swear. It signifies the absence of conflict. The Elohim declares it. No one can contest it. There wasn't an argument about whether there was going to be light. Once it was said, it was going to happen. It had to happen. Amen? And there was light. God said, let there be light, and light was. Praise the Lord. He swore by himself, and he created something out of nothing. Praise the Lord. We need to experience him in this creative expression. Amen? And we have. We just may not have understood it. Have, have you ever had God do something for you that came from nowhere? I mean, you didn't know how it could happen. You couldn't do it yourself. You couldn't make it happen. And just bang, it happens. It's a creative act. It's something that only God can do. We experience him in this creative expression. David said, now David had a lot of problems. We know he did. He was an adulterer. He was a murderer. He was a liar. He was a cheat. Right? He said, create in me, O God, a clean heart. Praise God. A something from nothing experience is what he's talking about. Hallelujah. All God needs to make something is nothing. Yes. And we're freaking out about everything and God doesn't need a thing. He started with nothing and made everything. All he needs to do in a miracle is to have nothing to make something. Yes. Praise the Lord. Elohim is demonstrated in the New Testament experience at Mary and oh, with Mary and the birth of Jesus to a virgin. Praise the Lord. And Jesus himself giving sight to blind eyes, hearing to deep ears, life to the dead. Mary said, I, how are you going to do this with nothing? I don't know a man. I've never been with a man. I don't know. I, I haven't had any kind of a relationship like that. How are you going to make something out of nothing? And she said, nevertheless, Lord, be it unto me, even as you've spoken. You can make something out of nothing. Praise God. And Jesus went around. People who had no eyes. And gave them sight. People that had no hearing. And gave them hearing. People that were dead. And raised them and made them alive. Took nothing and gave them something. Yes. Praise the Lord. Because that's how creative he is. He, he carries that name. Elohim. Jehovah. El Shaddai. Almighty, it literally means strong-breasted one. One who completely nourishes, satisfies, and supplies. Yes. And on Mount Moriah, Abraham takes his only son, the son that God gave him in covenant, and tells him to go and sacrifice him. And so Abraham is on Mount Moriah, and he has this covenant, and God reveals himself to Abraham, as the covenant God, as El Shaddai is the name that he gives him, a revelation of the keeping and sustaining power of his name in every circumstance of life. That's why when it came time to give up his own child, he knew God was going to supply. He knew him only as El Shaddai, the provider, the one who takes care of every need, the one who satisfies every desire, every hunger, Praise the Lord. His name. Again, El Shaddai in Jesus 
What's, 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 how's that manifesting? The same way. So the sick are healed. The, the, those that are in bondage are delivered. They're set free. Feeding a thousand or thousands of people with a couple of loaves of bread. And then there's Adonai. Translated Lord. It comes from a Hebrew uh, derivative word of uh, Adon. A-D-O-W-N. And it means to be a controller, to be sovereign, to be Lord, to be master, to be owner. The song we just sung. We belong to him. Right? We belong to him, but he doesn't want slaves. He wants children. Yes. How many of you know your children belong to you? Yes. Don't they? I mean, they grow up and they have their own life and all, but they still belong to us. Maybe I'm just selfish that way, but I mean, that's the way I think. We, you, you, you can't just not be, right? And all that means, this controller, the sovereign, the Lord, the master, the owner, it just means he owns and rules over everything. He, he created it all. It all belongs to him. He owns it. Everything. People are fighting for down here. Everything we're struggling about. And for what? It don't belong to you anyhow. You can't keep it. Praise the Lord. It's possible to know him as Savior, but not experience him as Lord. And that speaks to so much of the church world. But the fact that one of his names is Adonai gives weight to the idea that he wants to be Lord of everything in our lives. Praise the Lord. Then there's Jehovah. The eternal, unchanging nature of God. The name literally means I am. That's the name God used to instruct Moses in Exodus 3 that Tim talked about. So you can understand why Jesus totally confounded the Pharisees in John 8, 58 when he said before Abraham was, I am. They knew what he was saying. They just couldn't get their head around it. They couldn't accept it. They knew exactly what he was talking about. These are Jews. These are scribes. These are Pharisees. These are teachers of the law. Before Abraham was, I am. And the Old Testament Jehovah is the New Testament Jesus in Greek. Jesus, the word means Jehovah Savior in Greek. The name Jesus is translated Jehovah Savior. Praise the Lord. In Genesis chapter 21, verses 25 through 33. What, you don't have to go there, Suzanne. It's kind of time consuming and I'm trying to be on time here for a change. But Abraham gets into a disagreement with Abimelech. And it's over a watering hole. And their sheep were coming in and driving off uh, Abraham's sheep. And Abimelech's would drink. And then Abraham's servants would come back and they'd run Abimelech's servants off. So they got into this big debate. And Abraham said, well, I dug the well. It's my well. But I'm going to give you something to show you that there's no hard feelings. I don't understand what this is about. And neither did Abimelech because it was their servants were bickering and carrying on. And they didn't either one of them know really what it was all about. And so it just, what, what happened, Jehovah in this context it, it, it's the name of God that Moses called on to get some clarity because he couldn't figure out what am I supposed to do? I mean, I can't, we can't have these people fighting back and forth and killing each other over a water hole. But he didn't, know how to res he didn't know how to deal with the situation. He didn't know how to approach Abimelech in a way that they could come to an agreement or they could come to some uh, finality on the thing. And so uh, he, he, he digs a, or, or builds an altar there at the, at the pool or at the well that he had dug and he calls on the name El Olam, the eternal God, God's foreverness, the God of mysteries, the God of hidden things. Church, if there's ever been a time we need El Olam, it's today. We're living in a time of mystery. We don't know. Nobody knows. They're trying to tell us they know, but they don't because tomorrow when I turn on the news, it'll be different than it was today. Because they don't know. They just want us to believe that they know so that we'll have some security in that. No, I don't have any security in any idiot that's just sitting there reading a teleprompter telling me, like, I know this. That I'm supposed to embrace that now and just go. No, I'm going to call on the name El Olan. He, he understands them. It's not a mystery to him. It's only a mystery to us. Right? It's not hidden to him. He knows exactly. It's like Tim said, why, why try to hide it? Why try to pretend? God knows anyway. 
Even, even if Abimelech and Abraham didn't know, God knew. All he needed to know is what God knew about the situation and everything would be all right. We need to call on Elohim. Why? Because we don't have the answers. But he does. He's already been here and seen it. He's already been to the end of this thing. Praise the Lord. In Strong's Concordance, it's, it, it, it refers to that name as the vanishing point or time out of mind. Amen. That's spirit. That's eternal. That's not temporal. Amen. No end. No beginning. El Olam. Eternal God. Well, sometimes we just don't understand. Sometimes we're in situations. We're in them now. I just talked about circumstances come up. We don't know what to do. We don't really know what to say. Usually that's when we get in trouble because we just rush on ahead and try to do something, thinking that something has to be done, so I'll have to do it. No, sometimes we need to tap the brakes and look to God. When we're in situations we don't understand, situations and circumstances that we don't know what to say or what to do, we're supposed to build an altar over it and call on El Olam to speak to us of eternal, not temporal answers. The government gives us all the temporal answers we can handle. It's eternal answers we're looking for. I don't want something that's going to last for a month and we're going back into some other mess. I want the God who healeth all to be in charge. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Remember, what, what did Jesus say to John? Fear not, I'm the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. Behold, I'm alive forevermore. The mystery, El, Olam, El Olab says, here's the mystery, Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's only a mystery to those who don't know. Praise God. And then there's Jehovah Jireh. It means to see, uh, to appear, or behold. The Lord will supply. Sometimes it's a, you open the wallet and it's empty. You look at the bank account and it's setting on zero. You get a doctor's report. Jehovah Jireh. We haven't seen it yet, but he's already gone before us and declared the victory. Money in the wallet. Cash in the bank. Bodies healed. Delivered. Set free. Amen. He's already gone before us. Remember, he called on Gideon. He said, Gideon, thou mighty man of valor. Gideon said, well, who are you talking to? I'm the biggest coward in the family. I'm the dumbest one in the family. And my family is the dumbest family in the, in the tribes of Israel. You know, or, or words to that effect. We're nobodies. We're nothings. We never have been, never will be. And I'm the least of all of them. And you're calling me mighty? Praise the Lord. Jireh. I see your end. And it's not who you think you are. It's who I say you are. Praise God. How about Paul? Here's Paul. Before Paul was spirit-filled, before he was saved, he was on a roundabout journey to find Jehovah and didn't know it. Think of our own lives. I mean, we, we've all searched. And searching, I'm not saying we always search in the church. We may have been searching in a bar. may have been searching somewhere. We were looking for an answer. Amen? And this is Paul's deal. God already knew the end of Paul. He knew what Paul was going to be. He knew what Paul, he, he even said he called him cho, a chosen vessel. When did he choose him? When Jesus knocked him off the horse? No. Back when he was a Pharisee, back when he was killing people, back when he was throwing uh, Christians in jail, he was looking for an answer. He just didn't know where it was coming from, where it was going to be coming from. And God showed it to him. That's what, that's what Jehovah Jireh does. And then there's Jehovah Rapha. Jehovah Rapha means healing is what I am. Jehovah Nissi, banner. It's a rallying, the banner is a flag. It's, it's a rallying point for an army. From generation to generation, there will be victory for God's children. Because he's Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Nissi, the banner. There's healing for us. There's victory for us. That's what he's telling us in these names is so we'll understand and get a revelation of this God. Get an experience of this God, not just some head knowledge, but a real experience. 
And then there's uh, Jehovah Makedesh. It means sanctification or to be set apart. But not only to be set apart from something, to be set apart to something. We were set apart. We, we're in the world, but we're not of the world. We've been sanctified from the world to God. Yes. Praise the Lord. That's, our, that's who we are. That's our identity. Because of Jehovah Makedesh. And then there's Jehovah Shalom, the God of peace. Jesus said to the storm, peace, be still. He's still saying it to the storms of our lives right now. Peace, be still. My peace I give you. No, peace not like the world can give you, but the peace I give you is past your understanding. You can't even comprehend it. You just have to believe it. Jehovah Rohi. That's the word used in Jehovah, or excuse me, in, in uh, Psalms 23. The Jehovah Rohi is my shepherd. The lamb himself becomes the shepherd. God goes to the end to start the beginning. Praise God. Jehovah said, Kenu, the Lord our righteousness. Christ is made unto us righteousness. We are the righteousness of God in Christ. Praise the Lord. In 1 Corinthians 15, 34, it says, Awake to righteousness. Or experience this righteousness. Don't just have it. Have an experience in it. See what it can produce. See what it can do in a person's life. This is Jehovah Sikinu. And then there's Jehovah Shammah. And that simply means the Lord is there. If your back's to the wall, if you're feeling... Like I've had about enough of this, I can't take any more. He's present. When a loved one gets sick, he's present. He's present no matter how bad it looks. He's still there. Praise the Lord. In Psalms 23, verse 4, he says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thou art with me. That Jehovah is with me. And Jesus said, Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the earth. How I many of you remember junior high science? Take a magnifying glass, get the sunlight coming through it, and hold it up to some, a piece of paper or some cotton. And that magnifying glass, you end up with sunlight and then fire. And when the prism of that glass focused the ray of sunlight on a specific point, the result's fire. Praise the Lord. When the names of Jehovah are focused, really focused, the result is the name of Jesus. It means Jehovah Savior. It embodies the mystery of the person of God and all the amazing work of God. In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Look at Deuteronomy 12 and verse 11. This, this really excites me. Then there shall be a place. Then there shall be a place which the Lord your God shall choose to cause his name to dwell there. Thither shall ye bring all that I command you, your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithe and heave offering of your hand and all your choice vows which ye vow unto the Lord. The Lord says there will be a place the Lord will choose for his name to dwell. And ultimately that's Jesus. And of course us. Because he's given us that name. Praise the Lord. The name of Jesus in every dimension can seal us into a covenant relationship with God. All of those names were covenant names. Jesus is the ultimate covenant name. And when we use it, it magnifies or reinforces the covenant that we have with God. Because every time these people throughout the history of the Old Testament would call on that name, they were reminding of the covenant that God had made through that name. That's why the name, to, to, uh, for them to identify with his promise or his covenant keeping. And Jesus is the ultimate purpose for all of those covenants that God would be manifest in the earth and that all of those covenants would be ours through Christ. Not just individual ones that individuals got throughout the Old Testament, but every one of those names is condensed into the name of Jesus. Praise God. The name of Jesus 
in every dimension can seal us into that covenant relationship with God. It reminds God every time we use that name, in the name of Jesus, be healed. What am I saying? It's not just because I'm repeating Jesus' name. What I'm doing is the same thing that they did under the old covenants. They would remind God of the covenant. Not that he needed reminding, but we need to be reminded. Yes. So when we pray in Jesus' name, it isn't that we just say in Jesus' name and be repetitious and, and wrote about it. It's recognizing I'm calling on a covenant with my God. I'm calling on a promise from him that by his stripes we were healed. That he set us free from all of the snares of the fowler. That every word that comes out of my mouth has power and has authority if I recognize where that word comes from. Yes. And who's backing it up. Yes. Praise the Lord. Colossians 2, 9 and 10 again. It's so much more than a name. We've, we've just kind of piddled around and not realizing God took every part of him and condensed it into one man. Praise God. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. He said, someday, the day's coming, my name's going to reside someplace, and that place is going to be holy. Well, we have taken the name. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. By being in him, we have the same access, the same, the same covenants, the same promises, the same realities that Jesus dealt with. We are ours right now. They belong to us. Look at Mark 16, verses 17 and 18. And that just encapsulates all that we're talking about here right now. That's what Jesus was saying to these people after he had been resurrected. I'm going back to the Father. I'm going back to the position of Father. But the only thing you're ever going to see in heaven is Jesus. Praise God. These signs will follow them that believe. In my name, they'll cast out devils. In my covenant name, they'll, they'll speak with new tongues. They'll take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it won't hurt them. They'll lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. Praise the Lord. I ain't scared of no COVID-19. <laughs> Praise the Lord. You know, I, yeah, we go, we're all anxious because that's all we hear. We're inundated with this junk. But we have a God that is in covenant with us that tells us we're the ones laying hands on the sick. We're not getting sick. Yeah. Right. Amen. Amen. We take up serpents. That old devil, he don't want to get in a wrestling match with me because I've got a covenant with God Almighty. In the name of Jesus, I can send him running. I'll remind him of his future, and it's not good. It's eternity in a pit of fire. They drink any deadly thing. Somebody sneezes in Walmart. I'm not freaking out. I got better things to freak out about. It shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Church, we need to be laying hands on the sick. We need to, you know, I'm saying... Don't touch them. They got the COVID-19. How are they going to get rid of it? Unless somebody touches them. Unless somebody believes. We are to experience the name of Jesus. Not just have knowledge of it. Not just to know about it. We are to experience the name. That is a revelation of God that no one can take from you. And we all have it to a degree. But God is saying, this is the time to ref for reformation so that we can have restoration. So that name begins to move in the power that it has. But it has to happen through people who understand the name. Who understand the, the power and the authority that's behind that name. And it's God Almighty. It's the God that created this universe. That created everything that is. So much more than we even know about And he said, you can call me Jesus. And if you will, I'll call you Jesus. Amen? The firstborn among many brethren. The firstborn among those who would have the fullness of the Godhead dwelling in them bodily. We are complete in him, not in us, not in what we're able to do, not in our religion, not in our effort, not in our hard work, not in all the other stuff. We're complete in him. In other words, we're reunited with God. We're put back to where we were before we were in our mother's womb. Back before the foundation of the world. Amen.
Jesus told us, this is, what, this is the way it ends up. You and me, I'm in him, everything goes back to God. From whence it come. Praise the Lord. We are more than conquerors, church, through Jesus Christ. If we keep the focus where the focus needs to be, the enemy does not have a chance. He's freaked out. This stuff that's going on, this, this isn't judgments from God. This is the devil. This is Satan trying to get us into fear and into panic so that we won't operate in the name of Jesus. So we'll hunker down somewhere in a cave. Do like the scripture says in the last days, you know, they'll run and hide in the caves and the, the, the mountains will fall on them. There's no place to run from God. You've got to run to God. That's the safety. That's our dwelling place. That's the, that's the refuge. Praise the Lord. And when we come to the understanding, the experiential understanding of this God, everything changes. Not just for us, but for everybody around us. Everybody that we come into contact. We have influence. We have power. We have authority that none of us have ever understood to the degree that God wants us to. We have to get to the place that we are like Jesus. I only say what he says. I'm not, I'm not saying what Fox News says. I'm certainly not saying what CNN says. I'm not saying what this group says or that group says. I'm saying what God says. Amen. And that is no weapon formed against me can prosper. And every tongue that rises in judgment against me, I condemn because I have that kind of authority. In Jesus' name. Let's give him a hand this morning. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. So let's go, as he said, let's go in the power of his might. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Yes, Ron. Yeah. You talk about blood covenant, which God had made with us. Any blood covenant exchanged names between parties. That's right. He took our name and wrote it in the land of book of life. Yeah. And he gave his name to us. That's it. Praise the Lord. Like one individual says, the devil takes something. Amen. Amen. There's nothing he can't do. And we just have to go back to just think. Just think who we're dealing with here. This is God. The Almighty God. And Tim says it over and over, and it's so right that he does because we need to be reminded. All he's wanting from us is to believe. That's all we got to do. We just got to believe. And he'll open doors that no man can open, and he'll close doors that no man can close. This is the God Almighty that we're serving, that is our Heavenly Father, our Abba Daddy. Praise the Lord. And that was His choice to make, not ours. Glory to God. Give the Lord one more hand. Praise God. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. God bless you all. Go recognize who you are and what's capable in the name of Jesus. Nothing shall.